My name is Peter Liebman. I'm the director of the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research. I have the great pleasure of, of working here and on behalf of the board of directors of the Institute, um, a, a very warm welcome to you to the 2021 um, West Farmers Harry Perkins Oration. I would uh, like to say that uh, we are meeting on the land of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and I pay my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging. And tonight it is always a wonderful opportunity to celebrate great science. And I'm looking at our speaker who I'm going to take the pleasure of introducing to you guys all in a moment. And we've had people from all over the world uh, come and talk to us. And in fact it works out that most years we have someone uh, from Western Australia and then someone, uh, an alternate from the rest of the world. Uh, and so tonight is going to be a treat and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it very much indeed. I would like to particularly acknowledge a number of people who are here in the audience. Uh, Harry Perkins' daughter, Jane Allen. Uh, it's always great to see you here. Uh, West Farmers Executive General Manager of Corporate Affairs, Naomi Flutter. Lovely to see you again. Uh, we've got some Perkins board members uh, who are here, Larry Ifler, uh, Jan Stewart, I haven't seen Jan, not sure if she's made it, um, and Stephen Davis, a uh, warm welcome to all of you, and of course the rest of you who are very distinguished guests, uh, a warm welcome to you from us at the Perkins. This is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate an extraordinary man who was Harry Perkins, who I had the great pleasure of getting to know for a few years before he tragically died well, well too early, um, in his early 60s in 2002. It was his vision and commitment for this uh, organisation uh, that led to the establishment of the Harry Perkins Institute. Um, he was the inaugural chairman um, from 1998 till his, just before his death in 2002. He was a farmer from Bruce Rock uh, who enjoyed a, an incredibly distinguished business career, culminating in 16 years as chairman of West Farmers. Um, and for those of you who would know him, and some of you will have had the pleasure of knowing him, he was very humble, uh, he was visionary, and very much called a spade a spade. And I love that about Harry, a very much down to earth fellow. Uh, he no doubt would be incredibly proud of what the Harry Perkins Institute is now. Um, back in 2002, 20 years ago almost, uh, we've grown to have nearly 300 medical researchers uh, from across the globe working in beautiful state-of-the-art laboratories here uh, down at Fiona Stanley Hospital and we have one group who's at uh, Royal Perth Hospital as well. We, um, as someone said to us uh, the other day, we're a League of Nations. We have people from all over the world who work here. Um, it is a wonderful place to work, um, non-denominational in size, shape, religion, origin, language, uh, and the passion that joins us together is making a difference to human health, driving pioneering discovery, translating those discoveries into new diagnostics, new therapeutics, and new preventive strategies to improve our health. We are recruiting international leaders and we are retaining, which is really important with the brain drain, we're retaining some of the best and brightest scientists in the world. And you're going to hear from one of them tonight. These were things that were very dear to, to Harry's heart. Um, he was desperate to break down the barriers and to foster collaboration amongst researchers in town, across the country and around the world. And we're certainly um, a vision of that for him. We have an award-winning clinical trials facility, some of you will know about, called Linear Clinical Research, which is going from strength to strength and deals with companies from all over the world doing early phase clinical trials. And last year, during the, the, the heat, as it were, of the pandemic, Linear was able to continue doing its clinical trials and giving potentially life-saving life, uh, new treatments to patients with cancer, doing COVID trials. We did several COVID trials as well, and so it was a, a testament to the success of that organisation, and it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the Perkins. Uh, 
We have a bar, a bar discovery centre, which is a wonderful place. If you haven't visited it, you should when you next come to the Institute on Level 1. Uh, and we had literally thousands of students before the pandemic and thousands of students after the pandemic who come in. And also, it's open for the community to visit, come and be a scientist for a morning or a day and understand a little bit about what we do here in the pioneering bench work uh, within the Perkins. I particularly want to mention um, our two events. We had a wonderful walk uh, for women's cancer earlier this year on what can only be described as an absolutely torrential rain day. Oh. Torrential rain day. I'm not quite sure who in the audience did that walk. I know Jane, <laughs> there's a few, and my wife over there. It was, of course, um, it really did, it poured with rain, yet, Almost 500 women and some men and some kids all walked for women's cancer and raised over a million dollars. Spectacular event. And we recently had a, our ride, 200 kilometres. It's actually 210 kilometres, as some people's bottoms would well and truly know. Uh, and we raised $7 million a few, years, a few weeks ago, which was pretty special. I know there are some riders in the, in the audience as well. I do want to thank Jeff. Uh, Baker, I'm not sure if Jeff's in the room, uh, but he's the chairman of, of MACA, and it is the MACA 200 uh, Ride for Cancer that we, we did a few weeks ago. Um, I'm absolutely convinced all of this, this incredible uh, energy and focus uh, under health and medical research, Harry would love. He'd love to be here to see it. He'd love to be part of it. Um, and uh, it's a, just a, it's a, a wonderful tradition that we have this on an, on an annual basis. Um, Jane Allen is here. I'm going to invite her uh, to say a few words about her dad. It's a great pleasure always to have you here as part of the extension of the Harry Perkins family, as it were. So please welcome uh, Jane Allen to the stage. It's great to be here after a very interesting last two years. My role tonight is to give you some glimpse as to what the person Harry Perkins was. If you walked behind Dad, when he was tired, you'd see a slight limp. This was the legacy of his encounter with the polio virus. We're fortunate that this virus has almost been eliminated today due to medical research. We can only hope that this will be the future of COVID-19. Hope is something that Dad felt was vital to a healthy human being. This year, our family has been involved in both the Walk for Women's Cancer and the MACA Ride for, to Conquer Cancer. And that sense of hope was palpable at both of those events. To paraphrase Dad, this is not mad optimism, but rather a defeat of deadly pessimism. It is the confident expectation, belief and trust that things will turn out for the better and that we can work together towards the type of future we want to live. It was this hope that caused Dad to help establish this amazing institute that now bears his name. We hope that the work, through work, uh, the work of researchers like Ryan, as, uh, will understanding how our cells work, will help other researchers develop the treatments and make us all live a better life. This is what hope really is. My thanks go to Ryan, Peter, and all the researchers here that help us as a community have a hope in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Always love hearing from you. All right, so it's my pleasure now to introduce you to our um, 2021 Breast Farmers Harry Perkins Orator, Professor uh, Ryan Lister. And I'm going to embarrass Ryan, as it's, uh, it's a nice thing to do that. Um, Ryan um, is truly one of the most outstanding scientists in this town. He was a joint winner in 2020 um, of the West Australian Scientist of the Year. 
In 2020, he was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, which is the peak body in Australia. Very few people ever get elected as an Academy member. Um, he is a, or has been, a Sylvia and Charles Viertel Fellow, um, and that is one of the most prestigious fellowships that you can possibly get in Australia, and I should know because I've been chairing the committee for 10 years. And in this state, um, there's Ryan and only one other person. So that gives you an idea about the quality uh, of Ryan Lister. Um, he is the head of the Epigenetics and Genomics Laboratory at the Perkins. Um, and his work, to give you an idea of how spectacular it was and continues to be, uh, his work on the human epigenome, and that word you're going to hear more of, and Ryan will explain it in much more detail, was rated by Time magazine as the second most important scientific discovery of 2009. Okay, so this gives you an idea about the level. That's all science, not just health and medical research. His love of science uh, began at a young age, and his mum and dad are here, and I'm sure um, they are incredibly proud of his achievements. Uh, it sounds like um, they, it sounds like uh, you, um, you did a lot. Your, uh, your father's up there and he's recording this, which is wonderful. It sounds like you did a lot, the two of you guys, and there were some fateful events with gunpowder and various other things. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be part of the Q&A, Ryan. Um, after, after school, he completed his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and genetics at UWA and undertook uh, PhD studies in, a plant, in the plant area. And the beautiful part of this is that Ryan continues to have a laboratory at UWA in plants, and he has a laboratory here working on, on human uh, medical research problems. And the, and the biology spans both plants and human biology and human disease, which is wonderful. After completing his PhD, he was awarded a Human Frontiers Science Program postdoctoral fellowship, which is extremely prestigious, to undertake further studies uh, at the Salk Institute in, New in um, San Francisco uh, in California. And that's when he started uh, working on the epigenome. And he'll describe it in much more elegant uh, way than I can, but simply to describe it, it's the epigenome is the code that sits around the genome and turns on and off genes and tells the genome what to do. And if you think about the issue of, you know, we start from one cell and we then differentiate into livers and arms and legs and eyes, the complexity of that is the sort of area that Ryan's been working in. He developed technologies uh, to address those questions um, and with those technologies um, came a lot of discovery and a lot of um, incredibly worldwide recognition for Professor Ryan Lister. Um, it's my great pleasure, Ryan, um, to introduce you, to ask you to come to the stage and give us the, the West Farmers Oration which is entitled Instructions of Life, Unlocking the Might and Mystery of the epigenome. Please welcome Ryan. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Peter, for the, the kind introduction and kind words. And thanks, Jane, for um, sharing your, your thoughts on, and experience with Harry. And, and really, I hope today to um, give a little demonstration of some of the work we're doing, which is the fraction of um, what his vision and drive has, has led to the establishment of. So uh, it's yeah, a great honour to be talking today and, and presenting this oration, the, the West Farms Harry Perkins oration. And what I'd like to tell you about is uh, our work on, on understanding the epigenome, uh, this code that controls the information that is present within the genome sequence and plays really critical roles in, uh, in the development of our cells and our bodies. So uh, this essentially is their instructions that govern the information in our cells and leading to this, uh, here, what I call the, the instructions to life. Uh, I thought I'd start with just a brief introduction to a little bit of, of my background and where I came from. So um, I'm from Perth, I'm from WA, and probably unsurprisingly then, I have mining connections and have a long history of, of mining in the family. Uh, and this probably goes back to uh, the best example of this, which is my great-great-great-grandfather. His name really was John Hardman Australia Lister. I guess that's to remind him where he came from and that he was, I guess, a pretty tough guy. But he found, uh, discovered the first saleable quantities of gold uh, in Australia. This is in New South Wales. 
uh, which was then taken by Hargraves. Uh, but that, I guess, started the, some of the mining lineage, and that continued to my uh, grandfather, uh, who was mining with his family uh, gold out here in the remote WA, and uh, found that the gold started to, the gold mines were running dry, so it turned to what was surrounding him, his family there, which was salt, and there was just uh, lakes of salt everywhere, which was actually an incredibly uh, valuable resource in pure natural form to harvest and to take back to Perth and to sell. And so this is my grandfather here. And so my, my dad, who is here, continued in, in that line of work, and so it seemed my fate was set to, to mine salt. And I realised uh, in subsequent years that I was trying to be pushed down this uh, pathway as well. My dad would always uh, buy computers, uh, and uh, in these days this was the advanced Mac SE. But I realised after some time that the, the games he was buying to play on those had a particular angle that were directing towards a business or entrepreneurial type bent, which, for example, Lemonade Tycoon, or my favourite Run for the Money, in which you're an, uh, an alien that's crash landed on, on this planet and you have to mo mine raw resources and create synthetic bananas to sell to space simians to paint the spaceship to take off again. Now that may sound strange, but the stranger thing is that's actually getting close to some of the stuff we're doing in my plant research. So. <laughs> but at the same time, I had a, um, a great interest in, I've always had a great interest in, in living organisms and life, and this is me at about 20 with a, a coral reef tank that I had then, and reading fiction and, and uh, uh, ignited by the ideas, for example, in Jurassic Park, that this information that is, uh, that is sufficient to build all the complexity of our cells and the vast diversity of life forms on the planet is contained within this chemical structure here of DNA. And how could this chemical uh, structure, these ACTG letters, encode all the complexity uh, that we see in these, these different life forms? So I, I didn't mind salt, I mind genomes, and uh, under, as Peter mentioned, undertook my studies at UWA and then at the Salk Institute in San Diego, and now back to here. So, the, the question that really drives our research and that we and many others in the world have wondered and have been focused on for a long time is how the vast diversity of different tissues and cells with all their distinct forms and functions arise, uh, and there are hundreds of different cell types at least in, in the human body, how all this variation and complexity arises from the information that's present in just one genome sequence or two copies of one genome in each of our cells. This is a really important question because it's this information that is the, the foundation of life and encodes all the components of our cells. How this functions normally guides our development and growth, and when it's disrupted, it can lead to, to devastating diseases and disorders. So we want to be able to understand this, how this information is utilised and controlled, and to be able to remedy its dysfunctions if they occur. So I'm going to spend a few minutes now um, I guess starting from the start of what genome is, what the information is in it, and, and basically how uh, cells utilise this information and how it creates our cells. So we're made of trillions of cells, and essentially all of them have the same genome sequence in them. The genome is contained within the nucleus of the cell, and this, this uh, spherical type structure here, and it consists of DNA, and the DNA is composed of four letters, A, C, T, and G, so this is the chemical alphabet of the genome. And, as I mentioned, it's the same in all cells. Essentially, it's the, uh, the, the heritable instructions to build cells and to build organisms. It encodes the parts that cells require to build themselves and to function appropriately. Our genome is about three billion letters of ACTG long, split over 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. And uh, in, within this sequence of the A, C's, T's and G's is the information that encodes all the parts that are required. Within, uh, so a gene then is, is a portion of the DNA sequence and it is the, essentially the information, the blueprints to make a protein that carries out functions within the cell. So the DNA contains this information of the genes, the parts. It can be copied into a related form, RNA, which is a similar structure, a chemical structure to DNA and can, can contain similar information. And that RNA information is then translated through another process into a protein, and these are the parts of the cell that do all the work. So this is a, an animation of, in, of a cell, a human cell, and we have here the nucleus, this large structure in the cell, and within that is all the DNA, and within that is where the control of which genes are turned on and off happens. So within the nucleus, the DNA isn't just naked and bare, but it actually can form 
complexes and attach and wrap around uh, proteins called histones that form into, like these, these beads around which the, the DNA is wrapped. They're called nucleosomes. The DNA then contains this library of all the genes and can be organized in different structures by wrapping around these nucleosomes, these histone proteins. This is really important because it means that some regions of the genome can be wrapped up and inaccessible and others can be open and accessible when they're not wrapped up. And the DNA sequence, for example, of a gene is copied into an RNA form by a protein called RNA polymerase, which will go along and zip along the DNA and copy the base, the letters of one strand and form an RNA copy of that information within that strand. So this happens by a complex of proteins assembling at the start of a gene and it being triggered by various processes to initiate this process of transcription. And this RNA polymerase will zip along the DNA, copying one strand of the DNA and creating this RNA strand which encodes the same information that was within that gene, the same AC, TG information that was in that gene. And this is really useful because one copy of a gene can then spin off many, many copies of RNA. Which, can, which encode the proteins. This RNA then leaves the nucleus, travels into the cytoplasm, and there it can uh, complex and bind to a very complex cellular machine called a ribosome, which translates this sequence in the RNA, which originally came from the DNA information, into the corresponding protein. This happens by threading this RNA through the ribosome and reading the code through this um, there is adapter molecules, which then stitches together the amino acids that correspond to the code in the RNA. So as you read through this RNA, the ribosome is stitching together the corresponding amino acids into this long thread of amino acids that's a protein. The protein has 20 different amino acids versus the four letters of the DNA code, and so it can form va vastly more complexity. And this, uh, these are essential and um, functional units of cells. But uh, genes are not the only components that are, and the, the only elements that are present within our genome. We have gene sequences that encode genes, but we also have hundreds of thousands, millions actually, of these switches that control when and where genes are turned on or off. These switches we call enhancers, and they can be bound and recognized by specific proteins that are called activator proteins or transcription factors. And they can bind to these, and when they do so, they can bend over and come together and, uh, and arrange themselves on this RNA polymerase, which creates the RNA, and uh, kick off this process of transcription. So you can get these enhancers and these activator proteins, which will start this process of transcription, and RNA polymerase will spin off a, a copy of RNA that can then uh, be translated into the protein. So we have both the content of the, the genome in terms of the genes, which encode the functional units, but then we have all these complex switches that control the activation of these genes. So then if we have all this, uh, if the genome has all this information, all these genes, all these control switches, how is that static set of information then, which is the same sequence essentially in every cell type, how does that create this vast diversity of different cells that we see? How is this information, this essentially static information within the genome, uh, utilized to create this different variation. Well, an analogy you can use is a pile of Lego bricks, where you can take a, a big pile of Lego with all these parts, and you can use different subsets of the pieces of Lego and put them together in different numbers and combinations to create completely different forms and functions of, of uh, Lego toys. And similarly, that's uh, in a manner what our, our body does, where different cells will utilize their different pieces, their different genes. There are 20,000 genes, approximately 20,000 genes encoding the human genome, which make these tens of thousands of, of corresponding proteins. And different cells will turn on or off different genes and different combinations of them at different levels to change the parts list of what it's using to build itself. And we see this enormous diversity then of the resulting cells we can build from that, just as we do with Lego. So then we have in the DNA uh, some genes in a particular cell type, some genes that will be turned on and be producing RNA, and we have some genes that are turned off. But how does this, again, how does this differential activity come from the static information that's present in this DNA sequence? So we now know, and have known for some decades now, that in addition to the A's, C's, T's, and G's that make up the DNA sequence, 
we have supplementary layers of information that are superimposed on top of the DNA sequence that we collectively call the epigenome. And essentially, uh, these control the access of the cell to the underlying DNA, so the cell can either use those parts of, of the DNA and the information within it or not. What the epigenome consists of are minuscule chemical tags that can be added directly to the DNA itself, such as in the form of DNA methylation, or added to pro these proteins, these uh, nucleosomes around which the DNA is wrapped and organised in the cell. So these nucleosomes are made of histone proteins and have these long tails that can also gain these chemical signposts. And all these uh, chemical signposts can signal to the cell to use this bit of DNA and make it accessible, or to take this bit of DNA and compress it and wrap it up tightly so that the, the machinery of the cell, the RNA polymerase, can't access the underlying ACTG information. And so this is a really key feature of, of our cells, of cells of complex organisms that allow the modulation of the accessibility to the DNA. Again, what we're looking at here in the epigenome then are these tiny chemical tags added in millions of places throughout the genome. DNA methylation is this addition of a methyl group to the C, the cytosine base in DNA, whereas histone modifications are added to these uh, long protein tails that extend outwards from the, the nucleosome around which the DNA is wrapped and organised. And the different kinds of modifications that are added will affect whether that DNA can be utilised by the cell. If it's open, accessible and not tightly wound up, then it can, uh, RNA polymerase can transcribe, access the DNA and create an RNA form. If it's, however, uh, harbouring particular epigenetic modifications that signal to the cell to not use this bit of DNA, these will be recognised by other proteins in the cell which will come along and restructure the, the DNA and histone proteins so that they uh, are wrapped up tight and the underlying DNA information can't be used. But we now know that there's an enormous complexity to these epigenetic modifications. So we have different methyl groups that can be added to the DNA itself, and these, these modifications that can be added to the histone tails are vastly complex, where we have over 100 distinct known chemical modifications that can be added to these uh, protein tails that stick out from the nucleosome here. So there's this enormously complex code that can potentially signal to the cell how to use this information. Now, DNA methylation is a simple modification of DNA where only a, a CH3, a carbon-3 hydrogen, is added to, a, to, one, to, to the cytosine base, the C, to form methyl cytosine. But it's an essential component of the epigenome and of, the, the, of our cells. So these methylation tags are added at millions of particular points throughout the genome. Not all cytosines have them, only some of them do. And they signal to the cell. And we know they're really important in a variety of processes from our development to the learning and memory processes in our brain, uh, and they're highly disruptive in cancers as well. Generally how it's thought that they work is that a gene that doesn't have these methylation groups, DNA methylation tags added near it, will be transcribed and create RNA that can then create a protein. Whereas genes that have these methylation groups in their regulatory regions uh, have are blocked from the RNA uh, polymerase accessing them and aren't turned on. So this is a, a way that the cell can modulate how the underlying DNA is used. Another really critical feature of DNA methylation that I'll come back to uh, throughout this talk is that its patterns can be maintained through cell divisions. So our cells, uh, most of our cells are constantly dividing to replenish ones that, that die and need to be replaced to repair or through our growth and development. And when that happens, the genome has to be copied so that when one cell divides into two cells, each of those cells has the full copy of the, the genome sequence. So in this process of one cell dividing into two cells in mitosis, the genomes have to be copied. So each of the cells will have one copy from one, mum, one from dad, and each of those copies is duplicated as this process begins. In this process of this DNA replication where this other copy is made, each strand of DNA is copied, and the new copy that's, that uses the parental copy as a template doesn't have these DNA methylation marks on it. However, there are special proteins that come along and recognise the methylation that's on one strand. These little lollipops uh, resemble, uh, uh, signify methylation site, and they copy them onto the other strand. So you get methylation on the other strand. So there's this way that the information can be stated in contained in the DNA methylation patterns can be stably maintained and transmitted through cell division uh, so that this information can be, can be passed on.
So these epigenome modifications then are really important for controlling DNA accessibility, having highly compacted DNA with these methyl tags added to them and methyl tags added to the histones and the genes are silenced. Or, uh, in contrast, highly accessible DNA where the machinery can access it and generally is not methylated and doesn't have and has d different histone modifications and these genes are expressed. And you could take any type of cell and take a set of genes within it and you might find that different genes are open and accessible whereas other genes are highly compressed and aren't turned on, they're silenced. But then if you take a set of other cells and look at them, at this, the state of these genes and their compaction, you'll find that certain genes in some cells are open and accessible, but in other cells are closed and compacted and aren't being transcribed. So in this way, each cell uh, has a different pattern of which genes are being uh, given signals to be activated or, or suppressed. So then what we can think of is the epigenome as a form of punctuation uh, for the genome, for the information in the genome. And we know how important uh, punctuation is in, in our language, where we can see that a simple comma, if you remove it, can lead to dire consequences for grandma or uh, improvement in the, in the situation for, for the baby seals. Right? But it's, it changes, uh, it, it provides, I guess, context for the use of the information within the genome. And probably the best example of this, as, as Peter uh, mentioned beforehand, is the process of development, where we start as a single cell with two copies of the genome, one from mum and one from dad, and through the process of development, we turn into, we grow into this um, organism of, I think the last estimate was 38 trillion cells, with hundreds at least of dif different distinct cell types. And in this process, this new information emerges, and this happens without a change in the DNA sequence. We can imagine this as cells traversing a landscape going from a pluripotent state, which means many potencies, a cell that can turn into lots of different types of cells, and making decisions about their fate and their lineage they'll become until they become a specialised cell that, that expresses and turns on their own specific set of genes with their um, particular functions. And, um, and these decisions are imparted and locked in place through the emergence of different epigenome patterns in each of these different cell types. This used to be thought of as a one-way process. So if you had an undifferentiated cell and it became it's specialised and differentiated, that you couldn't reverse this process. But in uh, 1958, John Gurdon, uh, Nobel laureate John Gurdon, reported that this wasn't the case. He could take a differentiated cell and you could take the nucleus that contains the DNA in it and you could transplant this nucleus into an egg cell that had had its own nucleus removed and that was sufficient to form an entire organism, a tadpole in this case, showing that the DNA information present in this nucleus was sufficient when reprogrammed properly to form all the different cell types within that organism again. Uh, decades later, through understanding this basic process and learning more about it, Shinji Yamanaka, who uh, also shared the, the Nobel uh, Prize award uh, with John Gurdon, showed that in mouse and then in human cells, it was possible to take a differentiated cell and specifically <coughs> reactivate just four genes that had been turned off in those specialised cells, and some of them, over the course of a few weeks, would turn into the equivalent of embryonic stem cells, or very similar to embryonic stem cells. These are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. And you can then take them, and in a dish, you can give them particular signals and chemicals to turn into all these different specialised types of cells. And so this is an extraordinarily powerful uh, process and technology, where you can take spe a specialised cell, turn on, reactivate these four pluripotency genes, generate induced pluripotent stem cells from this, and then trigger them to turn into other uh, specific differentiated cell types. And this is really valuable because you can do things such as take a patient with a particular disease, take mature specialised cells from them, reactivate these pluripotency genes and uh, isolate induced pluripotent stem cells from them. You can then take those induced pluripotent stem cells, perhaps repair a genetic mutation within them or an epigenetic mutation, in a dish turn them into the, into the cell types that were disrupted by the mutation and have these healthy cell types that could potentially be transplanted back into people. Alternatively, you could take these iPS cells, turn them into the type of cell that's affected in the disorder, still with the, the mutation that this person had, and then stream thousands upon thousands of drugs for, to find ones that might remedy and fix the particular dysfunction of that cell. This cell reprogramming process fundamentally involves a change in the epigenome. There isn't a change in the genome sequence that's taking place. You're changing which genes are being utilised 
within those cells. So it's a purely epigenetic process. We know that the epigenome is really critical for, for human development and health, uh, involved in a wide range of processes from cell specialization to development to memory and learning. And we know this because if we take the, the factors, the cellular pr uh, proteins involved in establishing or maintaining or removing or reading these patterns and disable them, we get disruption and, and interference in all of these processes which is associated with a range of different diseases. So why is it important to understand this, these, these tiny little chemical tags that are added to the, to the genome? It's because the changes in these patterns underlie both our normal healthy development as well as being disrupted in pathological development in disease states. What's key to trying to understand these is first being able to read where these, read the patterns in the epigenome, where are these modifications located. We can use that to better understand the, the role of normal cellular function. We can uh, then underst understand map how they can be disrupted in disease states. And ultimately what we want to be able to do is then go in and repair and change these epigenetic patterns specifically where we want to edit the epigenome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do this reading of the epigenome and finally get to editing the epigenome. So a problem we approached um, some years ago now was that we want to know exactly which sites were methylated. The human genome contains about one billion cytosines, one billion C letters within its sequence. We want to know which genes have methylation tags associated with them and which ones don't. And we want to know the exact cytosine base that has the methyl tag and the exact ones that don't have the methyl tags. But the problem was how do we identify which of these one billion different cytosines have these methylation tags on them? Well, to do that, we need to turn to uh, technology of DNA sequencing. We need to be able to sequence a whole genome to be able to figure this out. And the human genome is, is fairly large, three billion letters long. And so very briefly, I'll just mention how, how we sequence a whole genome. Uh, what we do is we take this uh, instrument here, which we have uh, one of these on the sixth floor, which costs about as much as a house does. And we put into it one of these, which costs about as much as a car does. Um, <laughs> And we fragment, take genomic DNA from your cells, fragment it into lots of little pieces of a few hundred letters long, and they go onto the surface of this, of this flow cell device here, and the machine will read the order of the ACs, Ts, Gs, so AC, T, T, G, A, T, through the linear strand of each of these fragments of DNA. That's called the sequence of DNA, and the process of figuring out that order of these letters is called sequencing DNA. So you have these billions of short fragments of DNA, and then you have to computationally, that you, you figure out the sequence of, you then have to computationally reassemble these to figure out where they came from in the genome. And just to give you an idea of how much these instruments can um, generate these days, this one uh, instrument and, uh, and this flow cell can generate about 20 billion, the sequence of 20 billion fragments of DNA simultaneously in about 48 hours. Each uh, DNA fragment is about 300 letters of the DNA code long. So if you have 20 billion times 300, you get 6,000 billion bases or letters of DNA in, the, in about 40 hours. One human genome is 3 billion bases, so this is the equivalent data generation of about 2,000 human genomes in just this short space of time. So what was once a process that took many years to sequence the first human genome can now rapidly uh, be accomplished. And so we, with this, this experimental science rapidly also becomes a data science. So we're, this is just an example of how we're in the midst of this ongoing revolution in DNA sequencing technologies, where we see the cost of sequencing just a, a million bases of DNA, as a benchmark here over time, rapidly start to decrease when these new generation of technologies came on board in 2007 and has continued to uh, get a lot cheaper. So it used to cost $100 or, or more, a few hundred dollars for, to see a million bases of DNA. Now it costs uh, a fraction of, of, of a dollar, less than 10 cents. And this revolution continues with new technologies that are being developed. For example, this nanopore sequencer, which uh, uses a different technology where you have a protein pore in a membrane and it threads through one strand of the DNA double helix. And there's a, a current flow of ions going through this pore. And the sequence of DNA that's within that pore affects how much it blocks those currents flowing through it. So as this DNA strand is threaded through, you can look at the current change, and this will tell you what sequence is being threaded through this. And this can sequence up to a million base, a, a, a string of a million bases of DNA long. Uh, and actually, it looks not like a washing machine, but the, it's this size. So they can start to fit in the, whoop, in the 
into the um, palm of your hand. And ah, we'll have to watch this again. Okay, so the, the real advantage of these then is that they don't take the um, they don't take the DNA and fragment into such tiny little bits that then computationally you have to stitch back together, but you can get these ultra long strands of DNA which make it really easy to sequence someone's genome and piece them all back together. It's like if you had a million piece jigsaw versus a hundred piece jigsaw, it's going to be a very big difference in how complex it is to put those back together again. Okay, so there's new technologies that are always are rapidly advancing. As I said, they're, 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 the technology is getting to the point where you can hold this in your hand or even attach it to a, a phone to do mobile sequencing soon. So, the, the pun not intended. Uh, so we, we then, a number of years ago, used these DNA sequencing technologies to develop a method to map where all these sites of DNA methylation are located throughout a, a, a genome. Um, and what we call this is a DNA methylome. And this is a, the map of the precise location of all of these DNA methylation tags, which cytosines have them and which don't throughout the whole genome. The way we do this, and we started doing this using a plant with a small genome, is you take the DNA and fragment it into lots of bits. And in each fragment of DNA, you'll have some cytosines that don't have a methyl tag, and you'll have other cytosines that do have a methyl tag. And we do a chemical conversion step. We add sodium bisulfite, and this chemical converts a C into a T letter of the DNA alphabet. But a methylated C is protected from this conversion, so that when you then go and sequence all these fragments of DNA after the conversion, if you see a C remaining in the sequence, you know that it had this methyl tag attached to it. And so we can then shotgun sequence the whole genome after this conversion and generate this methylome map, the precise location of where all these methylation tags are in the genome. And so we did this a number of years ago now, and we've used this uh, in, in a, a wide variety of ways and systems to better understand how this information contributes to the complexity of, of cell regulation and, and uh, developmental processes. Starting, for example, with studying um, plant epigenomes and how they change in development and stress, generating the first maps of the human epigenome, uh, which reveal vast differences between cell types, and then being able to monitor how these changes you take a stem cell and turn it into different types of specialised cells. We've been involved in consortia that have mapped uh, DNA methylation patterns in a wide array of human tissues, as well as charting how the DNA methylome changes when you take a specialised cell and reprogram it into an induced pluripotent stem cell. We found unique patterns of DNA methylation in the human brain that change particularly during brain development, charted how these uh, evolved throughout the long, mi many millions of years in the past of vertebrate evolution, and how these gene regulatory processes um, originated and evolved. These have been really useful also in aiding our efforts to develop these new technologies for editing the epigenome precisely where we want. And uh, we've also been studying how these patterns change during the process of animal development so we can better study how these processes are likely taking place within our own human development. And so in the remaining time, I'd like to focus on, on three of these, these stories and, and give a brief uh, description of them. And I want to do this because they're all nice examples of how this information, how the epigenome is a form of molecular memory. So it's a memory of processes or events that took place encoded in this molecular form. I'll talk about uh, this lingering epigenetic memory that we want to get rid of and erase in induced pluripotent stem cells. Molecular memories that we want to be able to program and change at will in the development of these targeted epigenome editing technologies. And cell state memories of memories of developmental processes or disease states that we want to be able to read and detect for the purpose of understanding development and also understanding the emergence and detecting uh, of disease states and detecting them. So first, this lingering epigenetic memory we want to erase. As I mentioned before, we can now take a differentiated cell, turn on four genes, reactivate four genes, and create these induced pluripotent stem cells, and use those to turn into other cell types in the cell reprogramming process. So a number of years ago, we, want to do, we undertook a simple experiment, which was to take a skin cell, a human skin cell, and sequence its methylene, and reprogram that cell back into a stem cell state, induced pluripotent stem cells, and sequence its methylene and then convert that into a differentiated cell and sequence its methylene, as well as comparing to human, bona fide human embryonic stem cells and specialised cells made from them. What we want to see was the fidelity of this reprogramming process, how, how well the original epigenome states were erased. And what we found was that hundreds of places in the genome of these induced pluripotent stem cells, the methylation patterns resembled the methylation pattern that we saw in the original starting skin cell. 
So here I use this lollipop illustration of where there's uh, DNA methylation sites, the black ones. And where it's white, there's no DNA methylation. So we'd have these regions in the genome that didn't have methylation in the skin cells, and they were transmitted through to the induced pluripotent stem cells, and they were transmitted and propagated through the different shared cells we made them. But this was distinct and, and not present in embryonic stem cells or cells we made from them. So this is a memory of the cells that they began as. And we found these many hundreds of regions of this epigenetic memory that can persist through differentiation, and this can have an effect on the function of the resulting cells. Many studies have found that if you take induced pluripotent stem cells and in a dish turn them into, try to turn them into a, a particular types of cells, they have a bias to turn more effectively, more efficiently into cell types that are similar to the starting cell type that they came from, potentially due to this memory. What we want to be able to do is to repair these, essentially erase this memory so that you can take those induced pluripotent stem cells turn and turn them in an unbiased manner into any particular type of cell that you want. Now, why does this happen in induced pluripotent stem cell reprogramming and not in our development, for example? Well, uh, what happens during our development is that the epigenome is reset at two occasions. In the blastocyst, the very early embryo around the time of implantation, the DNA methylation marks are erased and re-established to get rid of memories of the past, and in the formation of the primordial germ cells that go on to form the, the sperm and the egg. And this was really essential, this erasure, for mammalian life and for the establishment of the, this potency within, uh, within the embryo. So we thought, well, if we could emulate some of these conditions that uh, achieve this early erasure uh, around the, in the blastocysts, maybe this could erase some of the memories. So we've undertaken studies uh, of testing different conditions, different media conditions that we can grow the cells in, and charting DNA methylation patterns through the process of reprogramming cells. Uh, in order to find conditions that uh, can potentially erase this epigenetic memory in, in what we'd call repaired iPS cells and indeed improve the differentiation bias or remove this bias of the differentiation of cells that we see. And this is contributing to what we hope is the formation of safer iPS cells that express the genes appropriately, uh, lower variability and higher reproducibility in these cells and more predictable and efficient differentiation them into cells that we want to use uh, therapeutically or, or in drug testing. Uh, and this has been uh, work that's really been led by Sam Buckbury and Daniel Pop, postdocs in my lab here at Perkins, as well as a collaboration with Jose Polo's lab at Monash. So this is an example of particular um, interventions or treatments we can use that will change the epigenome at many places, but what if we want to be able to go into a cell and to change the epigenome patterns at one very specific location where perhaps in a disease state the, uh, the, the, the DNA methylation patterns are aberrant or if we want to control a particular gene for other purposes very precisely. As I mentioned before, the epigenome, pat, uh, epigenome uh, modifications are this really complex code of, of 100 different modifications and this is a code that we'd like to be able to write and edit. And so we and other groups around the world have been now developing these molecular tools to be able to very specifically do this, to target a certain place in the genome and to be able to change the, the epigenome patterns exactly where you want. Uh, so we can better understand how these work and control them. How, this, uh, how we're achieving this is through an adaptation of gene editing technology. And many of you have probably heard about the CRISPR Cas9 gene editing technology, which a Nobel Prize was recently awarded, which allows you to target a particular place in the genome to edit the DNA sequence of the genome. Well, this is an adaptation of that technology. So I'll uh, briefly describe how this CRISPR system works, because this is what we're using. It consists of Cas9, which is a protein, and the Cas9 protein can complex and bind to an RNA sequence called the guide RNA. This then, Cas9 essentially surveys the genome sequence to find a match to that guide RNA sequence. So this Cas9 protein will uh, move along the DNA and will find, find the particular place in the genome where this stretch of the guide RNA sequence, or the ATCG, matches up with the sequence in the DNA. When it does this, this activity within the Cas9 protein will be activated where it goes and cuts the DNA strand and forms a break. And this is a step that's really critical in the process of genome editing but it's not something we want to do. So uh, people have developed versions of Cas9 that don't cut the DNA, and so what we have then is the ability to have this protein that we can then target to wherever we want in the genome just by changing this guide RNA sequence. And we can add other things to this nuclease deactivated Cas9. So we can add other proteins onto it which can change epigenome patterns, add or remove particular modifications. 
And these will go and bind to the region of the genome that we want them to bind to and have the potential then to uh, edit these epigenome patterns, these chemical tags that are on the DNA and change them on the histones or on the DNA itself. So we've, uh, we've been developing and exploring these tools for a number of years now. Uh, and one example I'd like to give is this um, more sophisticated system that we've recently built. This is work led by Tessa Swank and Christian Fluger in my lab, uh, very talented postdocs in my lab. <coughs> what they've done is create this Cas9 protein, which has this docking platform for up to four different uh, epi epigenome editing proteins, so that we can then recruit different epigenome editing uh, proteins onto this docking platform in a predetermined order. In a combinatorial way, they could then change multiple different layers of the epigenome simultaneously, uh, ideally to uh, change uh, target gene expression, or change these modifications where we want. I should note this is also an area of research that Pilar Blankfort here at Perkins has been pursuing for some time and is doing really nice work. In. But the problem is there are hundreds of proteins in our cells that control these epigenome patterns, reading or writing or uh, erasing them, and we don't know which ones exactly to use. So what we want to do is to screen these many different proteins uh, to identify those that are the most effective, that when we take them to the desired place in the genome, they edit the, the, the epigenome accordingly and correctly and effectively. And we think this will be really useful because they'll give us tools, molecular tools, to be able to edit this form of, of molecular memory and modifications within the genome to change gene activity, to be able to do it in a reversible way because you can add these modifications, maybe turn off a gene, but they, you can subsequently go and remove them as well. So not like a genetic change, which is going to be permanent, but an epigenetic change, which can be stable, but also can be reversed. This can be used to remedy various disease states where these patterns may be aberrant, or even to, in the future, what you hope to do is to be able to control uh, the, the identity of a cell. So you can target these to many places at once, to the genes that control the identity and the function of a cell, and change the expression of these. Or even add completely new functions to cells that, uh, that haven't, uh, haven't emerged through our, the history of our evolution. But I, ideally, what we want is to develop this suite of tools that will be really effective for controlling genome activity, and this will be particularly useful for controlling cell functions. For, for therapies and in bi cell biotechnologies. So finally, what I'd like to talk about in the last few minutes is um, the cell state memories that we want to be able to read and detect uh, because they hold a memory of development, a memory of the cell's uh, past identity or current identity, as well as whether it's in a disease state. So, what we, what we know now is that in the process of development, as we go in, in different vertebrates, go through this process from a single cell through to this complex organism, cells, these cells hold this molecular memory of regulatory events that happened in the past uh, and that defined their cell identity. And this is really important because it means that we can read those patterns of DNA methylation in the current, current cells that we can isolate and we can look at potential past events that happened in the past of those cells. This is also important because uh, DNA methylation states can be highly disrupted in, in disease, particularly in cancer. And we can isolate DNA. DNA is from cancers is present floating within the bloodstream. So that if cells hold a memory of what they once were and also a disrupted state that they've now become, if the DNA holds this molecular information and we can detect it, then we have this powerful means that, that people and, and companies and new therapeutics are starting to use of detecting the presence, for example, of DNA from cancers and, and where it comes from. So just briefly, uh, a, 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 I guess a basic science uh, big project that we did a few years ago was to follow the process of development and how the epigenome changed from in many different, in a range of different vertebrates, uh, fish and, and mice and frogs. And we were particularly interested in this period where Essentially, all vertebrates look really similar. This is called the phylotypic period. Uh, and if you look at embryos at this stage, they show this maximal morphological similarity. So they look really like each other. And molecularly, they're more similar to each other as well. This is when the vertebrate body plan is established. And we mapped the DNA methylation patterns before, during, and after this developmental stage, this phylotypic period, in all these species so that we could compare them and look at what is similar between these different species as a uh, hint as to maybe what is going on within humans at a similar developmental stage. Now what we see is that uh, there are changes in DNA methylation that occur at these switches that can control when genes are turned on or off. 
So if you remember, I told you that they have DNA that encodes the sequence of the gene that encodes the protein, but you also have these enhancer switches at different places in the DNA that can trigger the gene to be transcribed. Most of these enhancers typically, when they're not used and not engaged by an active activating regulatory protein, have a fully methylated. So again, using this little illustration to show methylated cytosines. But when these enhancers become in, uh, bound by and recognised by these activating proteins, what we generally see is the removal of DNA methylation in these open uh, little lollipops here. So we see a very localised removal of DNA methylation when these regions have been used to activate gene expression. And so this can happen as a transient event in development, but then that event, the, the occurrence of that event is stored within the DNA methylation pattern. What we see when we compare these different species is that these uh, enhancer switches that were conserved between these different organisms that control really important developmental processes at this conserved developmental stage, they lose their DNA methylation at this stage in embryogenesis. But then when we went and looked at DNA methylation patterns in a diverse range of tissues in the adult organism, in an adult mouse, we saw that they still had these demethylated regions, that lack of methylation carried through from this early stage of embryogenesis all the way into these mature tissues. So what that's showing us is that there's this molecular memory of these past gene regulatory events, some of them shared between lots of cell types. And this is a really nice work led by Osman Bogdanovich in my lab and a collaborator and friend, Jose Luis Gomez Gameda, who, who sadly passed away last year. So what we can do then is we can utilise this memory, this, this molecular information. So essentially this DNA, it, in our DNA, it holds this unique form of uh, molecular memory of a cell's past history, but also its current state. And this is encoded in the DNA methylation patterns that we can now easily read and map within the genome of these activation processes that were utilised. And we'll find regions like this that were activated and demethylated that are specific to every different type of cell because they all had a different pathway of controlling which genes were turned on or off in their formation. So in every cell there'll be specific signatures of a memory of the regulatory events that happened in the past formation of that cell, recording the DNA methylation patterns and that stably persist in those cells. This is interesting and useful because it could allow us to then reconstruct just by looking at mature cells the past regulatory events that led to the formation of that cell and how different cells may be related to one another. To understand processes in human development, particularly in uh, developmental stages which just absolutely can't be experimentally um, profiled. Uh, for example, uh, human in utero development. Uh, also for diseases and disorders, there are disorders where we don't know where the aberrant and disrupted cells came from or what cell they originally started at, but if they hold the memory of the original cells that they were, then we can potentially identify the cells that then eventually lead to those aberrant disease cells. And finally what I'll talk about in the last couple of minutes is, is tracking DNA origin. Identify, being able to identify uh, tumour signals within the DNA and the, the, the cellular or tissue origin of that DNA. So when we look at the DNA methylome of a cancer cell, what we see is that DNA methylation patterns uh, in the cancer genomes are highly disrupted but they're dis and changed, but they're changed in a, a, uh, a characteristic way. At the same time, those genomes, those cancer cells, still contain regions of the genome that have this lower methylation state, this unmethylated state, that is a memory of the cell type of origin, the original cell type or tissue that they came from, that the cancer came from. Moreover, Again, in our, in our bloodstream, we have DNA, and if you have cancer, some of that DNA uh, will be derived from those cancer cells. So this is circulating cell-free DNA. And this, these DNA states, uh, the, these DNA sequences from the cancer can uh, hold a methylation state that indicates that they came from a cancer, and they can also hold DNA methylation states that indicate the cell type they originally came from. And I, I should point out that we have uh, we have collaborators and colleagues here in Perth who are doing great work in this area, such as Elon Gray from ECU, who's been a, a, a pioneer in this area. So I just want to give one example of a test that's under, undergoing trials in the US that shows some of the, the power of these approaches and the, the future potential of how they could be used, of detecting cancer and its tissue of origin from this cell-free DNA. So this is from the company Grail, uh, and it's a Galeri test, or gallery, and this is a multi-cancer early detection test. It's called, uh, based on what's called the liquid biopsy, which is just drawing blood and, and looking at markers within the blood. So this uses DNA methylation patterns within the DNA in the blood, 
And this, their, their test can detect more than 50 different types of cancer from the DNA in the blood, and 45 of those have no uh, recommend, 45 of those types of cancers have no recommended uh, screening tests for them currently. And this is important because a majority of cancer deaths in the US, and presumably here, are from cancers where there aren't routine screening tests that are available for them, and detection of these is, is early detection is really critical. So they've been testing and doing uh, trials of clinical tests of this, of this platform. When they test it in existing cancer patients, they show that it can be sensitive, detecting cancer in more than 50% of the, these patients who are known to have cancer, and it's most accurate in detecting 12 types of cancers that lack routine screening tests, some of which are shown here. And then when they take this and test it on 6,000 asymptomatic people, so they don't, didn't know whether they had cancer or not, they found a low false positive rate, half a percent had a false positive in the test. But for 45% of the cases that had a positive result, it led to a cancer diagnosis, and for 40% of those, the cancer was at stage one or two. So this is early in, 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 the, in the progression. Uh, and for 95% of these, they could correctly predict the tissue of origin of that cancer on the, the first or second attempt. So you can see potentially the power of this in that you can, from a simple blood test, recover and measure these DNA methylation patterns in the DNA that is there and detect the presence of cancer and potentially also where it comes from and uh, probably also uh, give insights into stratifying patients and, and whether particular forms of cancer are present and may respond differentially. But there are current limitations. The sensitivity needs to be improved. It, um, currently, it's also cancer type dependent. It's good, highly sensitive for the lung, but uh, doesn't perform that well for the kidney. It's much more effective at determining um, the sensitivity is much higher for stage four cancers and lower for stage one. So we need to improve these methods. And one barrier to this, I, uh, I think, is the limited resolution of the current maps of DNA methylation that we have. Most of the maps of DNA methylation have been derived from taking a chunk of tissue, whether this is normal tissue like in, in the brain or the liver, or taking, taking a chunk of, of a, a tumour, a large piece of tissue that contains thousands, millions of cells, and there will be a lot, a lot of variation amongst those cells. And grinding all those cells up, I saying the DNA from them and mapping methylation in them, but you're just looking at the average of the signal of all those cells present. So it's the equivalent of essentially a smoothie you've formed, whereas what we want to know is particular methylation patterns in every distinct type of cell that's present. So that we can, when we get a fragment of DNA from the blood, uh, we can say, okay, this one matches really well to a healthy cell and this particular type of cell. This one matches to this other type of healthy cell. This one looks like it's from a cancerous state and matches to this other type, particular type of cell. The, these, our tissues contains vast diversity of different types of cells, each of their own for, functions. That's not only in our normal healthy tissues, but within cancers, there's this vast heterogeneity of the cells within them and an evolution and a change in the tumour cells that occur over time that can change their function. So what we want to be able to do essentially is to have maps of the DNA methylation state for all these different types of cells in normal and disease states. Uh, but this has been a challenge in the past due to the, the, the use of having to do this on very limited material, just two copies of DNA in each cell, and uh, the cost of it. But these technologies are now uh, advancing. So you, what you could do is take a tissue, isolate many thousands or millions of nuclei from those tissues, take individual nuclei and map the, the DNA state throughout the genome in each of those nuclei for a fraction of the genome. And from this, from doing this for thousands of cells in the tissue, you could generate complete methylome maps for every different type of cell within that tissue. So uh, really what we're looking forward to in the future is uh, advancing technologies that are able to create these single cell maps uh, in both health and disease states. And David Makosa, who's a, a really talented um, Forest Scholar and PhD student in my lab, is developing a, a lower cost method for single cell methylene mapping. And this is part of the Cancer Research Trust Consortium for Single Cell Genomics in WA, led by Al Forrest here, who's at Perkins. Ideally, what we'd like to get to in the future is having a map of all the, of the methylome in all the cell types in each organ in healthy states, and then a map for all the disrupted cells in diverse cancers, so we're much more effectively able to take the DNA from these types of liquid biopsies and map them very accurately back to their, to their origin, know whether it's, it's uh, a disease state or not and where it originally came from. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, and hopefully this has um, given you a, a, a brief walk through the, the importance of this information that is contained within the nucleus of our, our cells.
how this is essentially the instructions for how we're built and how it uh, can normally function and process, but also how it can be disturbed and how we can increasingly utilize and map this information, both to understand the, the fundamentals of how our bodies and other organisms are built and function, but also how this can be disrupted and develop technologies to better uh, detect uh, or correct these, uh, these rough, disrupted states. And finally, I'd like to, uh, of course, finish by thanking the, the many people who have contributed to this. So uh, I have a, a great team of people in my lab who have contributed to all this work, uh, as well as great collaborators, including Jose Luis uh, Gomez Scarmita again, who, uh, a, a friend and colleague who sadly passed away last year. Uh, a wide range of collaborators from around the world who we work with, uh, great resources and infrastructure here in Genomics WA. Uh, my ever supportive family who are very patient with me, uh, probably too long looking at DNA methylation patterns. Uh, the many funding sources who support this work and without which we couldn't do any of this. Uh, the many supporters uh, and donors to, to Perkins who give their, their time and, and money and donations to allow us to do this work and have the great facilities here. Uh, as well as from our institutions, University of Western Australia and the Harry Perkins Institute. And again, uh, thank you for coming and thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions. Okay, so it's over to you guys. Um, there are, we have got a couple of people um, who've got roving microphones and um, questions from the audience. Uh, you're most welcome. We've had this incredible tour into the complexity of cells that you probably never even conceived of. It's, it's, this, it's this wonderful tour de force. It's, it's quite spectacular, actually. So, questions? Yes, please. Ball is charging around a football field, crashing into each other and so forth. How on earth does the whole thing not become disrupted internally? And how does it all patch itself back up again? <laughs> uh, very good question. I mean, uh, so we have, uh, uh, we've evolved as animals have and all, all organisms have um, great repair mechanisms to recognise damage, to send cells to those sites of damage to clean them up to, uh, and to, to stitch together new cells that can replace cells that are damaged. If you're talking about um, the brain, that can be another case, a different case, because essentially the cells that are present in our brain are largely the ones that we were born with. And so damage to cells, damage to the brain, um, can be then extremely deleterious because you, it is still contentious whether you're getting newborn neurons in an adult in, in, in humans. If so, it's at a, at a very low rate. Um, so it, really, it depends where this damage occurs. But there are um, highly sophisticated processes by which the body recognises where damage is and, and can go and, and repair it. Um, if there, actually an interesting thing is that if there's damage in the brain actually, um, as, as we recently worked with another group in Melbourne that showed that if you have um, if there are, for example, seizures in the brain, potentially, or damage in the brain, you'll also get release of DNA. And from the cerebrospinal fluid, you can take that DNA and again identify the methylation patterns in it, which can potentially tell you which types of cells have been injured in those, those types of uh, situations. Please. In terms of copyright, and patenting, um, the grail and the gallery, who actually owns that? And what are the, I mean, a huge number of, um, a huge number of research people and research organizations here. What does that mean for the future in terms of, can we afford it, will we have to afford it, or what? Yeah, so, so who owns the, well, I, I, my understanding for tests like that is that the company will own the intellectual property for using that information in a particular way, so that they they'll be able to say we can we'll have we have a process for detecting these methylation patterns at these particular regions and using this to predict whether you have this type of cancer and where it came from, and the company will have uh, that as intellectual property, which is the basis of their of their, um, their business model. There have been you know, this is 
been a, a process that has evolved over the years where you've had some companies and patents in the past that have had very broad ownership of uh, DNA tests uh, and that can in some cases uh, raise the cost of accessing those treatments substantially but there have been in recent years challenges to that and how, how much of that information can be patented um, but uh, honestly I'm not a patent lawyer and, and, <laughs> and, and some of the details of that are beyond me but you know, for, for companies that are really driving the development of this um, having protection of, of those applications how to use that information is, is how they will sustain themselves and develop new ones. Thank you. Um, with regard to the uh, liquid biopsy testing, um, how far along is that? Is it readily? When will it be readily available to you know the, the, to the to GPs or at yeah. specialist clinics or whatever? So this is undergoing FDA approval currently in the in or waiting for FDA approval in the US. It costs about nine hundred dollars in the US to have the test done, and it's only you can get it with prescription. It's only being recommended. Um, if you have a history, or if you're thought to be predisposed to uh, formation of cancer, um, or if you have a family history of it, uh, it's not being and it's not being recommended as a replacement for other screening methods. It's an additional screening method that can potentially identify the presence of uh, or add new information to um, detection or diagnosis. Uh, there are lots of other companies that are also pursuing this, and lots of, of great research that's going on of figuring out how to detect this more sensitively, which regions in the genome to use as the best markers. Uh, so there's a lot of activity in this area, but um, it, it's, it seems like it's, it's going to be possible to get, at least in the US, in that type of prescribed form, um, very soon. Here we, I, we won't I, hold our breath here. No. Uh, I, I, I don't know. and it's, it's still undergoing clinical trials and, and development, so I guess they need to identify know when it's most useful to, to perform as well, when you're likely to get some usable information out of it or not. Uh, but I, I, I would expect that it will be done. Have these new technologies for detecting cancer given you any new insights into what causes cancer in the first place? Um, in cases they have, yes. So. There are, for example, uh, uh, certain brain cancers which are actually formed because of mutations in the genes that maintain the DNA methylation states. And so people have uh, been able to sequence the DNA methylomes, the methylomes of these, of these tumours, um, and see that because a particular enzyme that was required for um, the, the additional removal of DNA methylation was uh, mutated, actually there's an enzyme that makes a substrate for that, that enzyme to work. Um, it creates these huge changes in DNA methylation throughout the genome and actually these, these states, so that's identifying the you know, molecular basis of those cancers, but they can also use that information to uh, stratify and uh, identify which particular subtypes of, of, of uh, that brain cancer you have and to inform particular treatment strategies that, that could be pursued as well and which might work better. You mentioned that uh, uh, about 45 of the 50 cancers, there wasn't a test for. Um, so the five that have, they are the ones that you've, can you say that those are the ones that you've been able to um, sort out the methylation versus the non-methylation? Uh, so I think they, for all of those 50 types of cancer that they talk about, they've identified Places in the genome where um, it has, they, they have a particular methylation pattern that indicates where they came from and that they're in a cancerous state. Uh, those 45, the five that have, um, the, the other five are ones, cancers where there's routine screening protocols in, and procedures in place. So this would probably be for, for example, for, for breast cancer detection and, and mammograms. Uh, so there are a small number of these. That, that, of these that they're testing for, the, for which there are regular routine tests in place, but for most of them, there just aren't, there aren't procedures where we routinely go and to a physician and get tests to detect them. Uh, so what this is potentially allowing is all those other types that we don't regularly screen for to uh, detect them and their presence just through the blood. Can, can we take from that then that the other 45 will, will become approachable or 
I'll say curable in inverted comma. Once you um, identify that um, the the two the two you know the, the, the clear lollipops versus the yeah clear lollipops. <laughs> yeah. So th this is more of a for those it's more of an approach to detect them and that they're present. So a way that where you can have early detection of them from a blood test and say, okay, it looks like there is the presence of some DNA in you that's showing that you, you may have a cancer somewhere, and it looks like it might be located there, which would then potentially prioritise screening through imaging methods and, and bi other biomarker detection to go, okay, maybe it's here, maybe it's in you, we've got to conduct further testing to find where it is, and ideally it's found early where you can start um, treatments early or, or operations to remove them. Uh, so it really uh, helpful in, in catching them early, not, not necessarily in informing particular, uh, uh, not informing strategies to change those methylation patterns at all, but informing what type of cancer is present and where it might be. Could I just ask a question following on from that, relating to if you've got this genome that you've had from birth, why is the, what, what's the thing that is related to the timing? So, you know, you may develop breast cancer when you're 50, why didn't you develop it when you're 25? What is it that, you know, what, where's the breakdown or whatever that occurs that allows the aberration to become manifest in the body? Yeah, well, I, I, cancers are, are, it's a good question. Cancers are, are essentially genetic diseases where you have mutation of, of the DNA and that disrupts certain processes often that were, um, were, were protecting that cell from becoming cancerous, from un undergoing uncontrolled growth and proliferation. Um, so why we see it uh, progressively with more age is because our cells... Uh, from, from conception, our cells have been dividing and copying themselves. Most of our cells copy themselves, so not, not our neurons. Um, but in all our other cells, when they have to divide and, and replenish the cells that are dying, you know, our skin, for example, is all replenishing our liver cells, they have to copy the, the DNA each time they do that. And it's not a perfect process. So mutations can happen in that process, and so that's one way that you can gain mutations, and if that mutation just happens to occur, in particular component of the cell that's important for protecting it, it or controlling its growth site or allowing it to detect that it was starting to have uncontrolled growth and, um, and be destroyed by the body and, and by the immune system, then it can, you can start to lose those barriers against the cells, gaining this other ability to, to proliferate. Um, there's also just damage that happens from chemicals, from, from radiation, uh, so it's, it's time that we accumulate these mutations with age. And actually, we, we can detect that. So when I say that the genome sequence is identical in all cells, it, it's generally identical in all cells. But you do have these, uh, these mutations that will accumulate over time at particular positions. Uh, and there are also some other sequences that can actually move within your genome and, and jump around. Um, but largely, it's the accumulation of these, of these changes that occur over time, or with damage. really want to know is, <clears throat> if I eat more fruit and vegetables, <laughs> can I improve my epigenome and might I live forever? Uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, there, there are um, probably processes of, of repair, minimising um, certain processes of damage, for example, might contribute to it. So if those, those vegetables are high in antioxidants, perhaps it would limit some oxidative damage within the cells. Um, and there are lots of links between diet and, and disease formation. Um, can you live forever? Uh, we're, we're programmed to age. You know, we've evolved <laughs> to age. So currently, um, no, presumably. <laughs> presumably this is a program which, um, which you know, we, there are other organisms that uh, can live for far longer than we can. Their cells divide generally much more slowly than ours do. Uh, it may be possible ultimately to, to tweak our cells and get them to live longer, but not for any of us. Um, just, sorry, um, probably a, possibly a personal question, but was there ever a point in your life where it kind of just clicked? that medical research, or specifically research into epigenomes, um, was for you? 
Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think, yeah, and it's, it's, it sounds a bit lame in a way, but I, when I read Jurassic Park and thought, and this was because I, <laughs> I thought, could I make it? No. I, um, I didn't do biology at school, I stopped at, at, at year 10, I think I, I didn't do biology, and then I later read that and thought, well, it's just a really interesting concept, not that I thought that dinosaurs could be, you know, undergo de-extinction, but that all this information, this code, was present within, uh, within this, this chemical. Um, and really just, uh, I've always been interested in these in living organisms and how this complexity unfolds, and how can, how can all this process that you start as one cell and through a, this, this inbuilt, in a way, automatic process, it can divide and form all this enormous complexity. And third, 38 trillion cells in our body that work in a, in a cooperative manner. So it's a, you know, it's a, in a way, it's an evolved technology by an approach by or capacity by which cells operate that's um, that's come about through billions of years of selection. And so I, I think just marveling at how that that complexity and sophistication can happen just through. Uh, selection, the process of selection over billions of years. And now that we have, the, I think what, what really got me into it was that we're starting to get the tools to be able to look at it. So you could start to read this level of information um, and now increasingly and ever, ever faster rates start to be able to change that information, change the DNA sequence, see what it does or correct it. This gentleman over here has been. Thanks. Do, do we have a, a model, a research model or knowledge of what determines whether a cell, a stem cell, produces a tissue type, skin, nerve, muscle, etc. Yeah, so good question. So people have been mapping that and figuring that out progressively. So you can, for example, uh, identify these activator or transcription, transcription factors or activator proteins that bind to these switches, these reg enhancer regions within the genome. You can take a particular specialised type of cell, like a skin cell or a heart cell, uh, my heart's not there, heart cell, and you can identify which trans, you can detect the RNA in the cell, extract the RNA out of the cell, and you can sequence it, and you can identify then which of these activator or regulatory proteins are on in one type of cell, and which other different ones are on in another type of cell. And that can give you some information of at least those factors are important in determining um, some of the, the transcriptional states which genes are turned on or off within those cells. So we have these regulatory proteins which will go themselves and activate or, or turn off a lot of other genes. So people have, uh, for example, a colleague of mine has trained, has, has written programs and trained programs on that type of knowledge of which of these regulatory pro programs and factors are present in each different type of cell and can use that to predict which of those you need to turn on or off to turn one type of cell into another type of cell. So people are starting to figure out this logic, but there are many, many hundreds of these transcriptional regulators, and they happen in a, they, they function in a coordinated way as cells start from an undifferentiated uh, cell with potential to turn into lots of different cell types, and you'll often get hierarchies of them where one will function, that will turn on two or three more, and that will turn on all these other ones. Um, so our technologies are getting better at mapping those processes out to understand the sequential manner of it, but already we can take a few of these factors and that are off in one type of cell, turn them on and turn, for example, a skin cell into a neuron. Uh, I'm just taking a bit of a leap. Hello, Brian. <laughs> I'm, we haven't really talked about it, but I'm interested to know what implications this has for children with genetic disorders or when children develop things like muscular dystrophy, are we getting to the point where you could actually go in and, and snip that faulty gene out and, and replace it with the cells that you've done all of that work on to, to repair or change the whole body? And if you could, does that mean that the child will then become you know, without that disease. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. So, so treatments for these genetic diseases. So it, it depends on the case. And um, you know, we, we have two world experts in, in this area, um, Nigel Lang and Gina Ravenscroft here, for example, working on um, dystrophies and, and detection of these diseases and the genetic basis of them. Um, in some cases, it's been shown that some of these new gene editing technologies can have or... Um, uh, RNA technologies can have some impact. There have been some demonstrations in, I think they're only in mouse experiments so far, that you can, 
in, inject these gene editing uh, constructs for a particular type of a muscular dystrophy into muscles in a mouse and it can repair a, a particular mutation in a, a fraction of the cells and this can improve some of the, of the, some of the function of those cells. Um, there are also uh, Sue Fletcher and Steve Wilton uh, here at, 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 uh, at Murdoch have developed uh, antisense RNAs, these are uh, other RNA or small RNA therapies that can go and alter how different parts of RNA is stitched together in those genes. And this is now an approved therapeutic for, uh, I think, a particular type of muscular dystrophy in, in the US, which is restoring the ability in some, some boys to, to be able to walk again. So in some cases it can be, it depends on how, whether technologies, these molecular technologies can address and fix the particular uh, mutation that's occurred, the particular disruption that's happened and whether that can be done efficiently enough and to a level which can restore normal activity. But it, it's starting, but they, I mean, these are relatively new technologies that have emerged. This, uh, these CRISPR technologies, for example, have only been around for, for a few years now. Uh, so it's been a really remarkable um, uh, acceleration of research, or, or the basic discovery of how these proteins work in, in bacteria, uh, to then starting to utilise them in, in, in some diseases. You mentioned the process of screening for uh, cancer. Um, could the screening, if you know that you have a predisposition to a neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's or something, in your family, could the methylone help look at that and see if you're more so susceptible to neurodegeneration as well? Um, I think only if, so if, if there's not a genetic basis that we know that, that would signify it, for which you could just test any, any DNA from anywhere in your body. Um, if, it's, if already there's the presence of some neurodegeneration and if that leads to the release of DNA, uh, in the case of the brain, into, that would be released into the cerebrospinal fluid, then there are, um, there are some indications that we, we can start to do that because the DNA is present there. So you could say, well, do we see perhaps different methylation patterns that are from certain types of neurons that seem to be perhaps dying or at a high frequency dying, or maybe they show some patterns that are dysregulated. And we, we can't do tests directly on, on the human brain, but this is um, a possible um, biomarker that we can start to interrogate for. But that, uh, that's a, a pretty new area of research which uh, a number of research groups are trying, uh, are starting to look at the feasibility of. But we need to know the, the, yeah, the, the map, what are the normal states and what are the disease states that we're trying to detect as well. So I might um, call a question quickly. We are going to have an opportunity afterwards to, to meet and mingle um, and uh, have a drink outside and ask uh, Ryan any further questions. I feel like I've been in, transported inside the cell and watched, and watched all this incredible stuff happen. Transcription, methylome, um, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been transported right in there and I've got a, a bird's eye view of something I had much less information about before you started. It was a tour de force, Ryan, a fantastic talk. Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, Naomi Fodder um, from West Farmers to present uh, Ryan with the Harry Perkins Oration Medal. We're going to have some photographs, I think. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Astonishing. There it is, the oh, medal nice. to add to the collection. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, that's um, the 2021 um, Harry Perkins oration. Uh, just a wonderful night. Just think about it. Go home, look up transcription, look up methylome, look up DNA. <laughs> the wonderful thing is we've recorded this, uh, and it will go up onto the website, um, and you'll be able to look at it again and again <laughs> and again. And you know where Ryan works. He's here, and uh, he's incredibly emailable. But what a wonderful, wonderful talk. So please join me again uh, in thanking Ryan. <laughs>